case, this talk. In this talk, I want to um, look at three campaigns I've been involved in and look at how they um, bring uh, art and activism together. Um, but I first want to kind of set the framework, which I think follows on maybe quite nicely from what Sophie was talking about. This is from, from the Centre of Artistic Activism by Stephen Duncan and Stephen Lambert in America, who do a lot of interesting work. And they talk about artistic activism mobilising affect and effect, so don't worry, this is the only bit of text we've got to get through. Uh, artistic activism is a dynamic practice combining the creative power of the arts to move us emotionally with the strategic planning of activism as such, as such to bring social change. Art and activism do different work in the world. Activism, as the name implies, is the activity of challenging and changing power relations. There are many ways of doing activism and being an activist. But the common element is an activity targeted towards a certain way. Simply put, the goal of activism is an action to create an effect. Art, on the other hand, tends to not have such a clear target. It's hard to say what art is for or against. Its value often lies in providing us perspective and new ways of envisioning the world. Its effect is often subtle and hard to measure, and confusing or contradictory messages can be layered into the work. Good art always contains a surplus of meaning, something we can't quite describe or put our finger on, but moves us nonetheless. Its goal, so to speak, is to simulate a feeling, move us emotionally, or alter our perception. Art is an expression that generates affect. As any season activist can tell you, people just don't decide to change their mind and act accordingly. They are personally moved to do so by emotional powerful stimuli. We're moved by effective experiences to do physical actions that result in concrete effects. Affect leads to effect. What we might think of this as combined in a new word, a effect. Artistic activism is a practice aimed at generating a effect, emotionally resonant experiences that lead to measurable shifts in power. Artistic activism ties in the contemporary landscape, this is directly links to some of the things I'm going to show you. The first rule of guerrilla warfare is to know the terrain it moves it to your advantage. Today, this doesn't mean studying maps of the mountains of Cuba or the jungles of Vietnam. Our modern political terrain is highly needed. The landscape of signs and symbols, story and spectacle. To operate successfully on this cultural topography, we need to observe, analyse, and respond creatively. We need to be artistic activists. <clears throat> Acknowledging that the political landscape is also a cultural landscape opens up a new terrain to work upon. Whereas art tends to be limited to museums and galleries and access to street demonstrations and state houses, artistic activism is at home in town squares, shopping malls on billboards or through social media, as well as galleries and state houses. This new terrain, either the arty or political, is more familiar with it and safer to audience than a museum or a rally, and thus makes artistic activism more attractive, approachable and friendly than traditional art or activist practices. Artistic activism as an effective image, performance or experience is also well suited to the age of smartphone cameras and social networks. People don't share policy papers, they share things that move them. <clears throat> so that's really, I think, an important framework to, th to think about this work. Okay. Um, because I think one of the problems with artistic activism is, you know, one of the criticisms you can make of it is often that the political takes over the aesthetic. So you don't necessarily think that politics might be great, but the, um, the aesthetics may not be great. Okay, so randomism. <laughs> is a collective campaign that I'm part of. Um, it was set up a few years ago, about a decade ago, and it takes over, illegally, advertising spaces. Um, so it's a revolt against the corporate control of cultural space. And it's an international collective as well. It doesn't just happen in England. We do projects all over the world. And if you go on the Brandism site, you can find uh, and you can order the tools that um, allow you to open up bus stops and put your own work in. Now, obviously, I'm not suggesting that I've done this, um, but if you do want to do it yourself, you could do this. So these keys generally open up the kind of classic bus bus stops that we see. So, of course, this is a form of civil disobedience. It's, it's a very form of minor civil disobedience. Um, and, of course, we're making the argument about democracy and public space. So here you see a couple of brand, brand lists installing on the street. You'll notice that they're using what could be called the International Cloak of Invisibility, the uh, fluorescent jacket, um, because of course we put a fluorescent jacket on and do anything in the city, people think you're actually the person who's meant to be doing it and nobody stops you. So we do all of these things, we do all these things, some people do these things in the day and do it at night, you know, etc. etc. Um, you know what's been called so far. Um, so yes, as I say, you put the, and we sometimes still screen the name of the company on the back of the jacket as well, and that's provided on the Brandism website if you should want to pretend that you're JC to Soho or Clear Channel. 
Um, one of the biggest actions that we did, uh, which will be relevant to this exhibition, was in the Paris COP summit that Oliver mentioned in December 20, 2015. That was a big moment. These COP summits, they tend to be key ones where people think the breakthrough is going to happen and people thought Paris was going to be it. So on this one, we took over 600 advertising spaces with 80 different artists and put them all over the center of Paris. So this is one of the ones we did with us as a group called Occupy Design. We also allowed the designs to be downloaded from the website because people in Paris saw this and wanted to put them in their windows, um, so to increase the, the visibility. And it's also timed for the start of the summit. So of course the part of the, although you might see this in the street, and with the amount we do, that's the idea that you would see in the street, of course part of it is about trying to hijack the media frame. So on the day of the summit, what you want is a report on the summit in text, you know, the newspaper, but you want the images to be our images. So these will these posters attack the corporate sponsorship of COP, of COP, so this is some more examples here. So all these COP summits, are, I think the new one is going to be sponsored by Coca-Cola. You know, they're all sponsored by these massive corporate companies who are essentially responsible for climate change. This one was done by my friend, Studio Barnbrook Design. Uh, which is about the way that Volkswagen have been caught out for lying about their diesel emissions. So it's a kind of fake uh, Volkswagen advert, as you can see. Uh, and here you see an example in the press. So this, is, I think, is a really important aspect of hijacking the media frame and using the action to hijack the frame. <clears throat> this is my one. So what we do with brands is we, we, I might work with an NGO or we have particular themes. So this one was on the themes of toxic air in the cities, produced by car exhaust and fossil fuels being burned with cars and the way that cars dominated space. And my one was kind of took up the issue of both dominating space and killing people, because in London the air is very, very toxic and people have been lost, people die because of the, the invisible uh, toxicity, which again is not something that people often think about. Uh, more recently we've done ones that attack both the fossil fuel industry and the advertising industry that advertises for the fossil fuel industry. So you'll see here at the very bottom it says Mediacom uh, very clearly. So that's one of the companies that takes Shell's advertising and sells it. So it's a kind of double play. In this one, um, what I'm doing is obviously using the petrol station as a, a kind of one of the central points that we as consumers interact with the fossil fuel industry and then lay it over images of the Greek wildfires that had happened uh, that year. And obviously the petrol station is also on the fire, you can see it's starting to burn. A nice apocalyptic image. Um, and then another one for total. And again, these quotes, so when we do these actions as well, we research um, what the companies are up to. So this quote is directly taken from research about what total is actually doing in terms of its investment policies. So again, in the, all the fossil fuel companies, you find that they're investing far more in, in fossil fuels than they are in these other renewables. So despite the fact they present themselves as sort of going green or whatever, so just fan phosphates. <clears throat> and again, we might take over billboards, you'll see here. So not just bus stops, but billboards too. This was about the banks and the banks funding uh, climate breakdown. This is one, this is a mad one. This is one where they're cutting down forests to invest in, in, in companies that tear down. It's all crazy. Uh, so we're investing heavily in companies that tear down rainforests, so there'll be less trees to fuel the wildfires caused by global form of warming. So that's part of it, so particularly bad. <clears throat> then also uh, the airlines. So this was a more recent one that just happened all over Europe. And as I say, you see the aesthetic is very strong. It's obviously, it's obviously subverting the advertising imagery, but it's still kind of um, taking it another step further. Um, and can be read, I think, quite successfully as an anti-advertising image. <clears throat> okay, so the next campaign is BP or not BP. Um, this one is, has been trying to stop the BP sponsorship of the British Museum. So when we talk again about colonialism, obviously the British Museum is full of stolen stuff that the Victorians nicked from various parts of the world. And it has a very nice atrium in the middle. I don't know if you've ever visited London and visited the British Museum which is, of course, a kind of public space. So this is the interesting thing about using this space within the museum as a performance space. The BP or not BP was set up by theatre performers, and they've just done lots and lots of actions on a Saturday when it's really busy, 
in this space. So we've got things like, and also it's important to add that the, the chair of the, of the British Museum is currently Judge George Osborne, who when he was Chancellor um, 10 years ago in Britain, escaped all the austerity cuts, which a recent report has reported that's caused 330,000 excess deaths in Britain. He, once he left the government, he went to work as the editor of the Evening Standard, the main London paper, and then he was appointed the, the head of the British Museum, obviously we think deliberately to um, maybe fight against the campaign that they had. When we heard that the British Museum was having a Troy exhibition sponsored by BP, it made complete sense to build a Trojan horse. When I say Trojan, you say horse, Trojan, horse, Trojan, horse. We're protesting BP sponsorship of the museum. This morning, BP, or not BP, brought an enormous wooden horse into the British Museum without permission to tell them that it was time to end their sponsorship deal with BP. We brought it into a side gate with 15 helpers and uh, parked it here. Because this is the place where it really needs to be seen. It had to be wooden, and it had to be big enough to fit people inside it. We've got a purpose built sound track by a sound designer. <laughs> it's solar powered, people locked on inside so we can't move it. So I've been there for a British and we've got sounds is the main with this end. And in the in the east wing, there's lots of seating. It's time to kick BP out of the museum, it's time for BP to fall. Please join us here at the British Museum at midday tomorrow. There'll be lots of um, people around in the museum to show you where to go, let you know where the activities and the speakers are happening. So come along, it's going to be a great day. So I think you know when the when the piece over here says we've got to do work that's on the scale of the crisis, I think these things are kind of getting towards the scale that things need to be. And then there's kind of all sorts of other interesting layers to these protests. So as I say, the British Museum is full of stolen stuff. So we get people like Indigenous activists, this is a, an Aboriginal activist coming in here to talk about a particular shield that's in the British Museum that he wants repatriated uh, to Australia and does a kind of a, a teaching around the object. Um, you might label the things with the kind of truth of kind of what they are, particularly in relation to either whether it's stolen or the BP sponsorship, so people understand that. And this sort of shows you the scale of some of the things. So this is in the entry of the museum. And then there's a big fine with the BP octopus at the end. I know this 
<clears throat> and as I say, that, that exhibition was called Sunken Cities, which is kind of a gift as well, you know, so they're all the, the way that they also don't think about the name, well, they think about the naming of things, but of course it has a direct relation to obviously what's going to happen uh, if the tides rise, you know. Okay, so then the final uh, um, uh, collective is Liberate Tate. Uh, this is the only one that isn't still going, because this is the one that has, that has been successful in its goal. Um, this was instigated in a really, very interesting way. So John talked about Jay Jordan, who's down in the video downstairs. Jay has a long history as well in the anti-capitalism been doing stuff alongside each other for about 25 years. And they, Tate, in their wisdom, invited Jay to come and lead a, a workshop in disobedience in the Tate. Because, of course, again, you know, this interesting thing is that museums are having to respond to kind of what's happening in the outside world. And this is about 10 years ago now. Um, and, of course, Jay, uh, you know, the people turned up, the volunteers who wanted to do the workshop turned up. And, of course, Jay wasn't going to let this opportunity go to not do something really disobedient. Um, then, kind of, what's interesting, as the workshop developed, the take of kind of wind that maybe something really disobedient might be happening, although they hadn't decided on what. And he had to have all sorts of high level meetings with the management, who, he, which he recorded, and they tried to tell him like, the things he could or couldn't do. And he said, well, it doesn't work like that. And then actually, he left the workshop, developed the idea themselves. And actually, what they ended up doing was a very minor action, actually, initially. It was on the top of the tape here, you have the name of the artist who's showing. And they just put up art and oil, as you can see here, on the window, and that was the disobedience that ended that workshop. But then the people in the workshop thought, well, that's not good enough, you know, because we haven't ended BP sponsorship uh, in this museum, but we want to end BP sponsorship in the art institution, you know. So one of the things that uh, rebrand is obviously very street orientated and public place oriented. This is another public place, but it's kind of obviously one that artists can really have a, 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 a reunion with it. Because obviously these are art institutions. In the past there would be an institutional critique with people like Hans Hacker, maybe criticizing things within an exhibition. But this takes things one step further in terms of not giving permission to protest or perform in the, in the museum, like the BP or not BP, and do a series of actions in the, in the Tate Modern, in the Tate Britain, again using things like the Turbine Hall as a public space, to try and stop, to really balance the Tate essentially out of their sponsorship. And that goes alongside a campaign with the trustees uh, to get them to believe in stopping um, uh, the BP sponsorship too. So the first action that happened was in the Tate Britain, and it was called Human Cost. These were all performances, but they weren't tagged as actions or um, um, activism in the sense. They're all performances. They were all when they were finished. The Tate always gets a record of the performance and the kind of the details of it, as if it was a piece of work being exhibited in the, in the museum itself. And this was a simple one, which is literally of someone stripped down naked, and they, were, uh, got, they get molasses, and boil molasses, and that looks like oil. And that was poured over them as a kind of, obviously, to, well, I think this is very rich, this work, it's to give out the human vulnerability and all sorts of other things. And you see here, again, we get the front page of the Financial Times. And there's been, and you have to look at the very tape side, really, to see the amount of performances. I mean, again, amazing level of kind of thinking about the aesthetics, thinking about what the performance is trying to do, thinking how it might relate to the exhibition on at the Tate, which you often did, like the BP or not BP. This was one that, that was about, we found out that the BP only give £240,000 to the Tate a year, which is nothing, to have all their branding over everything. So, um, <clears throat> one of the things I did for the group as a graphic designer was produce this Tate money, Nick Sirota on one side and Lord Brown, who was one of the Tate's uh, board, uh, board chair, uh, who was also a former BP, head of BP. Um, we made these £20 notes. We made 240,000 amounts of these notes, and they were and they were um, distributed out from the from the balconies in the Tate as an action, again, an unauthorised action. And of course, this creates a you know, people are in the museum. They wonder what's going on. This was another one in the Tate Turbine Hall where um, a group went in and planned to stay all night. And what they did was they took quotes from various books and wrote over the entire turbine hall floor. They did manage to stay in all night. They actually smuggled in a compost toilet because the Tate shot off all the rest of the museum to them and trapped them in the turbine hall. So they kind of knew that might happen. And smuggling these things is also part of the, um, the work. Um, and so you end up with this whole floor. Uh, with all these texts on when we get in the morning. Now, what the Tate did here 
was shut, keep the museum shut until it could clean the entire floor in the morning before letting people in as a, as a way to undermine this sanction. This is one of the most impressive ones, it's called The Gift. We got a wind sail from Wales and we looked, uh, cut into three parts and we reassembled it in the tape in the turbine ball. Again, there was no guarantee that we'd get it in, but we did. And we left it there as a sculpture. Uh, and the idea of why it's called The Gift is because in Britain, you can gift a piece of work to a museum and if you do that, then they have to discuss whether they take it to their collection. So we forced a discussion about that. They didn't take it to the collection, they took it to the breakers yard. But, you know, I think it's actually a very beautiful piece of work, um, as, long, as well as making a very serious political point. And then, I'm going to show you this, uh, this little video just to kind of finish off, because we've kind of been seeing the talk. Um, some people might know this man, he's called Reverend Billy. He's an, uh, a performance artist from America. He takes on the role of a preacher. Which obviously in America, he's kind of taking on the role of the TV evangelist type preachers, which are very reactionary in their politics. And he, he flips that over. He sort of has a church, uh, sort of choir that work with him. And we brought him over to cast out and uh, exercise BP from the Tate model. And again, there's people come to the back in the Tate and they start hearing stuff. It's watched by loads and loads of people. So after five years of doing things like that, 
BP ended their sponsorship after 26 years. Now, of course, they said it was nothing to do with us. The decision just came about out of the sky. But as I say, we had a whole campaign with the trustees and we knew we were winning over the trustees. And again, in terms of media, talking about the media frame, you can see what image The Guardian uses to illustrate this story. Um, and that, this is what's happening. So this is actually having a real effect. So this is trying to get some fossil fuel sponsorship out of the museum using these tactics. This is from BP or not BP, this is an image they made. So on the left is where we started from with all the companies sponsoring nearly every one of the institutions. And you can see on the right, there's only now a few left. And that's it.